And joining us now here on the Jay Stevens podcast, it is Keith Yabanez. I should have probably asked you how to pronounce your name, your last name for, prior to recording, but we'll just roll with it. Uh, Keith Yabanez, of, uh, he covers Gonzaga. He's the editor of the Slipper Still Fits, the SB Nation site that covers Gonzaga basketball. Keith, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jay. Thanks for having me on. How's everything going? Pretty well, man. Just trying to stay as warm as I can with this crazy snow that we got here in Indiana. Uh, I'm curious, though, Keith. I noticed that every SB Nation site has a unique name to the school. So the slipperstillfits.com. How in the world did you guys come up with that phrase for the, the, na the name of the site? So for that site name was courtesy of a gift from Gus Johnson, the great Gus Johnson, when he was announcing Gonzaga's uh, 1998 Elite Eight run. Uh, so Casey Calvary took the ball in uh, to beat Florida. Gus Johnson just let out this iconic call saying, the slip Gonzaga basketball, the slipper still fits. You know, and it's, a, it's a tagline that fits well with our site and what Gonzaga is all about and its origins. Um, although I think at this point now, uh, 22 years later, maybe the slipper uh, Cinderella moniker might not be as appropriate as it was back then. But, you know, I'll let other people decide that. <laughs> so was that Mark Few's first year at the school? That was his first year as the head coach. Now, he had been at the school for a number of years before that as an assistant. Um, but actually, no, I think he – his first tournament run was actually the year after that. Okay. He was still an assistant on that staff, and okay. the head coach at the time – got offered the job at Minnesota and took it. Um, just Cause I mean, it was, he got a, a $7 million or not seven million, seven figure offer. Oh at Minnesota yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, like yeah, you can't turn that you're money gone, down. Man. And I mean, Gonzaga wasn't what it was now then. So he, he took off after that one year and then Mark Hughes, uh, he took over the head coaching job and he's been there ever since. Nice, nice. It has been a fun run. Uh, Mark Few there. And I'm curious how you as someone that covers a team how you would respond to this question. Let's say I am someone that knows nothing about Gonzaga basketball, not even the history of the program to get to where they are right now. And you're looking at this, this one season together and it's in the entire 20 games that they have played. How would you describe the play of Gonzaga basketball this year to someone that knows nothing about the, the program? I would say Gonzaga basketball this year, um, they play the most aesthetically pleasing style of basketball in college basketball, I would say. I think they run the most um, similar offense to an NBA-level offense, and I think that's what att attracts great players to their school. Um, so for a casual observer, you could do a lot worse than just turning on a random college basketball game and watching Gonzaga. Like, you're not going to get a 50 to 55 slog fest like uh, certain mm -hmm. Big Ten teams. <laughs> you're right, you're <laughs> right. In Big Ten country. Uh, so for the neutral, you're going to see awesome, awesome motion offense, a lot of cutters, a lot of mo movement. Um, they share the ball really well. They're very well coached. It's a very unselfish basketball team. And I think that's, that's a culture that's been cultivated over a long time. I think it's a hallmark of almost pretty much every Gonzaga team, especially over the last few years, is uh, unselfish DNA and how they play and everyone uh, working together for, for team success. How does Mark Few culminate this environment or a culture where every player is so unselfish? You know, I think he's pretty selective about <clears throat> the type of um, athletes he targets to recruit. Um, he's fit and, and personality is a really big consideration for him and the coaching staff in terms of the guys they bring in. They want to make sure all those guys – um, are predisposed to, to want to share the ball, but also will buy into that culture that he preaches um, and express like an understanding that, you know, their, their team success is definitely built on um, playing for one another rather than their own numbers. So I think he's, he's really selective about that. Um, he knows when to walk away from a recruit. That's, that's happened on more than one occasion if he thinks that guy's not going to fit in. Um, and I think for the most part, that's worked out well for Gonzaga over the years. It has, man. And I've watched him play some basketball this year. And I'm a person I don't like watching blowouts. So when it comes to Gonzaga basketball, I might turn them on first half, second half, first couple of minutes, like, wait, this game's already over. And I'm going to I'm going to try yeah. to find something else to watch. Um, 
But these guys stay focused. And I know that with young people, and I know when I was that age, it'd be really, really easy for me to lose focus from game to game to game. Because at some point, you're like, look, we know we're more talented than everybody else. We know we, know we probably have a better coach than the opposing team. We don't have to play hard for this next five to seven minute stretch. We don't have to go all out for the next, for this uh, the first half of this game because we know we can turn it on the second half and come back and win. How in the world are they able to stay mentally focused when there's so many things pulling them left or right, not just being young people in America, but also being college students as well? No, I mean, that's a great point. Um... And I mean, I won't say that they have been focused 100% of the time yeah, this yeah, yeah. season. There have definitely been some lapses here and there. But I think yeah, for the most part, um, you know, I think they really just enjoy playing together. Um, and I think that's borne out when you watch them play. There's just a lot of joy on the floor. And they just enjoy playing basketball with another with their friends, playing a really beautiful style of basketball. And I, so I think, like, when they're up by 20, it doesn't become boring for them. I think they're just always looking to make – the right play, doing the right thing on the floor. And, and that's where they derive like their, their fun and enjoyment out of it. And I think that translates to, on the screen when, when you watch them. Um, and it, it makes them an, an easy team to root for. Although they seem to have lots of haters on the internet that we have to, to beat back. But yeah, I, I think the coaching staff just does a good job with that. And I think also because the, the depth of talent has gotten so much better over the years, like, you know, guys, they want to keep their spots. They want to keep their minutes in the rotation. And they know there's competition behind them. So they don't drop their level. And they'll hear it not just from the coaches, but from, from each other. They hold each other accountable pretty well. And that just goes back to the culture we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of culture and um, playing together and actually playing hard so you don't lose your spot, there is a young freshman in Jalen Suggs who has come in and played to me, better than expected. Now, you're a freshman in college basketball. There are going to be those guys that come in right away, step in, and fit right into the culture and get a lot of playing time. But playing with guys like Kispert and Timmy, I always wanted to say Drew Tim, but I heard people call him, uh, <laughs> or, remember, in the broadcast, like, no, his last name is Timmy. Yeah, but Jalen Sucks, yeah, Jalen Sucks comes in, third leading scorer on the team with 14.2 points a game, and he's fitting right into whatever – the team needs him to do to score the basketball. Speaking of a young guy, he fought to get playing time, fought to get a starting spot, and he has sustained it. What has he meant to the success of Gonzaga this year? Oh, man. I mean, he's been huge, and um, it's been awesome to have him at Gonzaga. He's so fun to watch. I mean, the point guard position is extremely important in Mark Pugh's offense. Um, I mean, he's the first freshman year starter – Gonzaga has had at that position since Josh Perkins was a freshman Ooh. like five, six years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's usually, you know, there's usually a veteran at that position. Last year was Ryan Woolridge, who was a graduate transfer. So, yeah, there was a little bit of – there were some questions coming into the season about how a true freshman was going to adapt and, um, you know, run such an important position. Because Gonzaga's offense is, is very much read and react. We don't – Gonzaga, we <laughs> – uh, I say like I'm playing. Gonzaga doesn't <laughs> run like too many set plays, you know. So it, it's definitely learning, like, the philosophy. This is how we play. This is how you're expected to read the defense, and everyone needs to be reading it at the same time. So it's a lot for a freshman to, to take in and handle, but he's done a really good job, and he's done it with, you know, a, a very experienced point guard behind him and Andrew Nemhart, who had 60-plus starts at Florida, which is, you know, that's, that's no slouch of a basketball program no. down there either. So no. he's held off Nemhart, he's locked down that position, and I think he's just helped Gonzaga take it to the next level. I mean, he's such a great defender on the perimeter, super disruptive. He reads passing lanes really well. And Gonzaga's transition game is lethal. So with him on the perimeter, locking down pe penetration and manufacturing turnovers, he's really helped Gonzaga's running game. Um, defenses, like, obviously have to respect his athleticism and his ability to get to the rim. And so there's not a ton defenses can do in terms of making sure they're, they're stopping Suggs while not detracting away from the rest of their defense. I mean, you have, like you mentioned, there's Corey Kispert out there who's a four-year starter as a senior. Then Drew Timmy, who's also an All-American candidate. Those guys, like, you can't leave them. Um, so I think Jalen just makes Gonzaga's offense much more dangerous than it's been in years past just because of his, his athleticism and his, his two-way ability. 
Yeah, you're right. And I, I went back and looked look at some numbers here quickly of just some, some quick percentages that uh, shooting field goal percentage and then also three-point percentage of Gonzaga this year. Most of the guys that I look at, they're above 50% shooting from the field. Everybody that I listed is above 45% shooting from the field. Uh, Jimmy mm -hmm. shooting 68.1%. Kispert, 55.8. Suggs, 51.4. Ayayi, 58.2. Nimhard, who you just mentioned, 46.9. Then I also wrote down Anton Watson, um, 62.9. No, his minutes are less, but he's still producing when he's on the court. And this is, not, this is nothing new, but you mentioned the motion offense, kind of the read and react style. There are going to be defenses that are, I mean, opposing teams, especially in the, especially in the NCAA tournament, that don't have much time to prepare for Gonzaga, you, let's say you play on a Friday, then you play them again on a Sunday. That one day, and you, 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 the opponent plays on Friday. Gonzaga plays somebody else. They both win. One day in between, then the other team plays Gonzaga. With one day in between to prepare for it. this basketball team, Keith, it's very, very hard to prepare for a team that is this efficient with the basketball in their hand. No, that, that's uh, exactly right. You bring up a great point. I think Gonzaga is extremely difficult to prepare for um, just because they have so many options when, when they play um, because it's read and react. You know, it's, it's not like you know exactly what they're doing. Even if, if you've, you've scouted them um, in advance for a sufficient amount of time, not even just one day, um, it, you can't just set up your defense and know, like, if I see this action, we can take away this angle and then, like, you know, we've stopped this action. Like, that's – that's just not really the formula to beat Gonzaga. No, no. So with short preparation time, I think you really got to hope that Gonzaga just shoots itself in the foot because I mean, they don't <laughs> they don't miss a ton of shots. Like you no. just re you read off all of their sh their shooting percentages. You know, it's a team that's really disciplined. They don't take bad shots in their offense like ever. That's why the shooting percentages are so high. They always move the ball to get the best shot possible. So you're not going to see a game where we, Gonzaga plays for 40 minutes and guys are just jacking up contested threes all day because um, that's not going to be the recipe for success if, uh, in a tournament setting. So if you want to be Gonzaga, you're going to have to force some turnovers, although they take care of the ball well. Um, you're going to have to slow the game down, limit their second chance opportunities. But yeah, it's, it's a tough team for, to prepare for on both ends of the floor, the offense and the defense. And I think on the flip side of that, because of how Gonzaga's um, offensive system is, has been created and built and how they've all been taught, I think that makes them well prepared to go into a tournament setting where they don't have a lot of preparation time because it doesn't really matter to them. It doesn't matter what other teams are doing. Um, at this point, especially the experienced guys, they've seen pretty much every defense they can see. Uh, Mark Pugh does a really good job of scheduling non-conference games to prepare the team for all the various types of systems that they might see in a tournament setting. Um, so nothing will be new for them. And yeah, they're not dependent on on executing, dependent to a, or catered to a game plan based off of an opposing defense. They're just going to run their offense. They're going to play their their style of basketball, and most of the time they'll beat you doing it. You mentioned the non-conference games that Mark Pugh does a phenomenal job of scheduling tough ones. Earlier this year, at then number six Kansas. Now we all know how Kansas season has gone, but mm -hmm. um, Gonzaga beat Kansas. 102 to 102 to 90. Gonzaga beat then number 11 West Virginia 87 to 82. The game against Baylor was postponed. Was hope we could get get that rescheduled at some point. It doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, I but, know. Such a bummer. Yeah, no, I know. It's crazy how this season has gone. Uh, they did also beat number three then Iowa 99 to 88, and then also they beat. Number 16, Virginia. My handwriting is bad. So I, I think it's 98 to 75 was the outcome of that game. Just a slacking, a beatdown of those games. And the players know going into the season, you have to be prepared because you see, if you just see the name without the ranking, Kansas, good basketball. West Virginia, good basketball. Baylor, gotten better at basketball. You know what's to come, taking the rankings aside. How in the world, and I don't know, like, Mark Few's offseason program, what he's doing before to prepare his team for kind of the gauntlet, the tough part of the schedule, because the WCC is not as hard as the non-conference schedule is. What is Mark Few doing to prepare his team for the beginning of the season and then also for the NCAA tournament during both portions? The competition will be a lot tougher than the conference that Gonzaga plays in. 
Yeah, no, that's also another good point. I think I've, um, it's something I've mentioned uh, in my writing throughout the years, how Gonzaga is kind of in a different position than most power programs in that, you know, like you see the Kentuckys of the world, but not mm-hmm. this year. Yeah, yeah. They, you know, they get better throughout the course of the season because mm-hmm. they need, they try to trend upwards for conference play. That's when like the most, most of their tough games will be. Whereas Gonzaga, um, you know, their, their schedule is very heavily front loaded. So they don't have the luxury of kind of using buy games at the beginning of the year to figure each other out, get sharp. Um, so yeah, that off season preparation is extremely important. And I think a, a big part of why it works is that Gonzaga doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have five starters to replace every year, like a Duke or Kentucky. You know, they they don't have a slew of one and done to replace each season. So there's always at least a few holder, holdovers in the starting lineup um, that can help be a bridge towards any new faces. I mean, there's going to be a, a, a freshman to bring in or a grad transfer, but the grad transfers are experienced, so they'll pick things up right away. Um, but I think I think part of that is just, it goes back to the recruiting thing we talked about before is that Mark View and his staff, they all recruit guys um, who are basketball intelligent, who they think will succeed in the program, succeed in the style of offense and defense that they're going to play in. So there's not that big of a learning curve when they step up. And then, yeah, they, they drill hard um, once practice season comes around. But I think a lot of those guys too will, They'll play pickup games with each other in the summertime at the kennel. A lot of the old Zags spend their off seasons, even if they're playing over, if they're overseas or playing in the NBA, a lot of them come back to Spokane in the summertime and there's just pickup games every day. So those current Zags will play with like NBA players or guys killing it abroad in Europe. Um, And, you know, they, they learn from them. I think that's a big part of it too, is that going back to the culture thing is that there's such a, a family oriented environment with the program that, it allows for like organic and natural environments like that to happen. And then that allows Gonzaga to just hit the ground running when the season starts, because, you know, it's not like those guys are seeing um, things for the first time. Like they've pretty much played with Zags who've been in the system for 20 years for the last few months. So they know what they're supposed to do. Um, And I think that's why they've been so successful with their non-con schedule. I'm curious, man. I just had to look look something up very quickly. You said old players, they do come back to Spokane and play. Have you ever seen John Stockton lace up his lace up his shoes, put his short shorts on, and play pickup with the guys? Oh yeah, he plays there all the time. Yeah, uh, he, yeah, he's he's still he's still a regular. Their their pickup games, um, you know, he's still got all his old tricks. He can still hoop it up. So he he doesn't uh, shy away by any means, and I think that just uh, really adds to the competitive level. Like, I mean, he's he's definitely older in age, but he's still very much the competitive John Stockton he was as a pro. Um, he's got a lot to teach those guys. Um, and I will share this anecdote. I was, I was talking to Nigel Williams Goss, who was the point guard of the 17 team a few mm-hmm. years ago. Mm-hmm. And he shared with me that John Stockton, you know, put a call in for him, uh, endorsing him to the Utah Jazz, who ended up drafting Nigel in the second round after oh, wow. Gonzaga's final four run that year. So, you know, John's heavily invested in, in the guys who come to Gonzaga. Um, so it's, it's just awesome to, to be able to get a John Stockton, a DeMontis Sabonis, um, Kelly Olenek. Those guys all come back. I know I'm sure Jalen will do that in the future once he's off in the NBA. And, you know, those guys should pass on their wisdom to the current crop of Zags. What is a basketball scene like up there? Going away from Gonzaga specific, just basketball scene in general, maybe playground or just basketball, because I have heard just from people that have been out there in that area, that part of the country, that Gonzaga's basketball scene is something that basketball fans will love because they love their basketball out there. What's it like on a day-to-day basis for not just the, the players on the team, but just like regular people and the everyday person when it comes to just playing pickup basketball games? Yeah, no, basketball is it's, – it's big up there. I mean, Spokane hosts the world's biggest three-on-three basketball tournament every summer. Oh. They, did it last, they didn't do it last summer because of COVID. Right, right, right. But, yeah, look up Hoops Fest. And check it out. I've well, heard of, I've heard entire, that before. Yeah, pretty much the entire city of Spokane just turns and they put uh, basketball courts everywhere, and it's just a giant tournament. You know, everyone c- converges on Spokane. A bunch of old Zags and current Zags are there, um, and it's a big deal. And and Hoops Fest is directed by Matt Santangelo, who's on the original '99 Gonzaga team. So, okay. you know, there's there's just a lot of that uh, Gonzaga culture embedded in the entire community. So it's it's big up there, and then, 
you know, the basketball scene at the high school level is also pretty strong in Eastern Washington. Okay. Uh, obviously, Adam Morrison was a local kid before he went to Gonzaga. So, um, and so is Anton Watson, who you talked about earlier. So the basketball scene is competitive at pretty much all levels. And it's, a, it's big up there for sure. I, I, I bet. I know I, where I live in Indiana, basketball is king. Um, high school right. basketball here yeah. is huge. Um, college basketball and the pros, college basketball is good. Pros are popular, but high school basketball is crazy, dude. I mean, like the size of the gyms are insane. But then when I heard about Spokane, and I, 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 when I think about the Pacific Northwest, it's an area that I want to go, but I've never been. And I heard a lot of great things, not just about Spokane or just the state of Washington, but other play, other areas out there. There's so many hidden, hidden gems. And as soon as I heard that Spokane and basketball, there was like a love connection. I said, oh, man, I want to get out there sometime. And since you're here, I was like, I might as well ask Keith about this just to see like what he knows about that scene. Because um, it really seems like people that go there, they love what they see because the basketball scene is really insane, like, as you said. Yeah. Yeah, no, you got to get out there. Like, you got to get out there for Hoop Fest. And, you're like, you know, even, um, like, the Gonzaga women's basketball team, they're a ranked team. They're really good. Like, their home games are sellouts, too. They're a hot ticket just as much as the men's team. So everyone just loves their basketball no matter what it is. Um, they can't get enough of it. But I'll, I, I will say, I mean, Indiana high school basketball is like a religion. So I will acknowledge <laughs> that. There might not be anything in the country that comes close to that. Maybe Texas high school football. But, uh, yeah, I respect the Indiana high school basketball. Dude, it's insane, man. I don't think anything approaches that. But I'll, I'll say the Pacific Northwest likes their basketball. Yeah, and I mean, even, so even on the, the western side in Seattle, I mean, the, the high school basketball scene out there is pretty crazy, too. I and mean, Jamal Crawford and Brandon Roy are, uh, I think, big, big proponents of the high school basketball scene out there. Okay. So okay. you got a lot of talent that comes through that area. Um, so, you know. Basketball's king in Washington. Okay, I gotta get out there to check it out, man. You got you uh you have me interested, more curious than I already was. I recently went back. I got two more things before we wrap this up today. I went, recently went back. Actually, I saw an article. Uh, Ken Palm put out their National Player of the Year rankings. Number ten, Corey Corey Kispert. Number four, Drew Timmy. What makes them so special? Oh man, those their their understanding of the game is really special, and Drew his footwork and his, his technical abilities are so refined for a true sophomore. I um, mean, he came in that way last year and I mean, he's just gotten better as time has gone on, but his footwork in the post, if you watch him, it's like, it's art. It's, he's so good down there. Um, he's able to wriggle out of any trap that comes. Um, he's really good about positioning, finishing with either hand. And I think that makes him highly efficient down there. But he can also stretch out defenses, and he can pretty much attack a defense from any angle on the floor. So it's not like defenses can just load up on him at, on one of the low blocks and, and try to take him away. He's able to just set up on the perimeter, play the slip, slip and roll game or a pick and roll game, a pick and pop game. And, and then Corey this year, I think it surprised most people, uh, even me in, in the leap he's made. He's always been a really good shooter. That's what he's been known for. He helped space the floor for Gonzaga's offense. but the work he put in over the off season to make himself a complete basketball player and kind of play his way into the, lo the NBA lottery um, is pr pretty amazing, especially for a senior who will be old uh, come draft time. But he's just such a good leader. He never takes a bad shot. I mean, he's shooting like 49% from the three-point line this season, which is absurd. <clears throat> but, and, and Mark Few calls him the poster boy of what Gonzaga basketball is supposed to be. And I think I interviewed him when he committed to Gonzaga as like a junior in high school. And I could tell then that he was extremely mature, extremely hardworking. Um, and that's only, and he's only proven that throughout years at Gonzaga. So those guys are, are special, special guys. I'll miss Corey when he's gone. Drew might come back maybe, hopefully we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, um, they're, they're the epitome of what Gonzaga basketball is in terms of being special players, but also not being selfish players. Um, for how good they are, they, you never see them hog the ball or um, it's never about them. Their agenda is just team success. So and that's what makes them really dangerous. Last but not least, I couldn't ask anything about Gonzaga basketball without talking about the head man. We, we sprinkled him in a little bit, Mark Few, but didn't really harp on or even highlight the fact that I think I saw it in one of your articles, it may have been the latest article that – he has won, Mark Few has won 20 games in his first 22 seasons in 
as Gonzaga's head basketball coach. Tom Izzo has gotten a lot of attention this year because his 22-year tournament streak or years of going to the tournament, that's in jeopardy because Michigan State basketball is not that good. Mark Few has found a way to keep the success going over and over and over. And even last year when there was not a tournament, Gonzaga was still a good basketball team. How does he do it? Oh, man, if, uh, if I knew the answer to that, I think I could be consulting and making some big bucks at the NCAA level. Probably. <laughs> a lot of programs would like to know what uh, the recipe is and the secret sauce that Mark's using up in Spokane. Um, but I think he's, his staff, he's had together for a really long time. Tommy Lloyd is his right-hand man, and Tommy's been on his staff for as long as Mark's been the head coach there. Uh, Brian Michelson is his other um, – primary assistant was a walk-on at Gonzaga like 20 years ago and has uh, been on the staff since then. Those guys aren't leaving. So I think there's a lot of continuity, which helps obviously, because you know, they know what kind of guys to recruit and uh, who to walk away from. They know who's been successful there. They understand what Mark's expectations are. He gives them a lot of leeway and responsibility. So they feel like they have a lot of ownership in the program. I think that's why we haven't seen them leave or, or bolt for head coaching jobs. They're really happy with where they're at. Um, and they're content with their situation and like that continuity over time, you just don't really see that at high level programs. I mean, good head coaches lose assistance to head coaching jobs at a lot of other places. And you don't ever see a guy like Mark, or a guy at a program like Gonzaga was 15, 20 years ago, keep its head coach for that long. Um, so I think, Mark staying at Gonzaga, understanding the culture there, getting the support he needs from the university, um, continuing to uh, build on their program. I, like he's not the same coach he was 15 years ago. And I think that's another key point to highlight about his success that he's had <clears throat> is that he's a much better coach than he was during the Adam Morrison era in the mid 2000s. Uh, the offense has evolved, the defense has evolved. So I think he's always learning, he's always pushing himself. He's not just uh, teaching the same exact things to a different group every year. Um, and I think that's helped Gonzaga continue to uh, move upward on this trend that we've been seeing over the last 20 years. And I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon until Mark retires, and then we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think we're still a few years away from that. So um, I think we've got a lot of good years for, of Gonzaga basketball ahead of us. Sure hope so, man. Sure hope so. Keith, this has been fun. I'll let the listeners know where they, let the listeners know where they can connect with you via social media, and then also where they can read some of your work as well. Yeah, I'm on Twitter at SlipperyKY, so I'll just apologize for that handle now. And then uh, check out our website at slipperstillfits.com. Uh, we've got lots of great content coming out all the time, um, especially with the tournament coming up. You know, we're just going to be churning things out, so come give us a read. Uh, hit us up in the comments. We love talking with our readers. And, yeah, hopefully I'll talk to some of your listeners soon out there. Hope so, man. Hope so. Keith Yibinez uh, covers Gonzaga basketball for SB Nation, the slipperstillfits.com. Thanks for coming on the J. Stevens podcast. This, is, this has been fun, and I'm going to try to plan some time to get out there to Hoops Fest to check that thing out, man. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Jay.